Oh, hi everyone, and welcome back to this week's still untitled cybersecurity news segment. If you have any ideas of what we should call this segment, what we should name it, let me know in those comments as I am still a bit clueless. But anyway, it has been a bit of a slow news week, I will admit. However, I've made it my mission to find as many small, juicy morsels of a story that I can, and I've come up with quite a bit. In the news this week, IBM has developed quantum computer safe cryptography. Wah wah wee wah! Kazakhstan is not very nice, after all. Also, the Apple card is stupid. However, first off, Steam. Steam, or rather Valve, has found themselves in hot water over the last couple of days. As is becoming the trend, Valve launched their bug bounty program on HackerOne in late 2017, and some pretty glaring vulnerabilities have been found since then. For example, last year Valve paid $20,000 to a single hacker who found a bug that generates unlimited Steam keys. The bug hunter here, Moskowski, said in one case he managed to generate over 36,000 keys for Portal 2. Madness. Though fast forward to a couple of days ago when some new bug bounty drum hit, Russian bug hunter Vasily Krivets found a privileged escalation flaw in the Steam client itself. He submitted it as usual through HackerOne's channels, however Steam refused to pay out, stating that because the security hole requires local access to the Steam client itself, it therefore wasn't really a vulnerability after all. And this pissed him off. Though, I suppose they do have a bit of a point. If someone has local access to your computer, then you're already in big, big trouble. The Steam vulnerability, you could argue, would just be like putting expired icing sugar on what's already a very moldy and cancer-inducing cake. But on the other hand, you do have a third-party code running on Steam all the time. After all, it's a marketplace for third-party games. So this makes it a pretty attractive target. Vasily says, are you sure that a free game made of garbage by an unknown developer will behave honestly? And no, you can't be sure. Anyhow, it goes without saying that he was pretty annoyed about not being paid. According to him, eventually things escalated with Valve and I got banned by them on Hacker One. Now, now that's pretty vague. Escalated could mean a lot of things. My guess here would be that he got pissed off, a few four letter words were exchanged and then he got banned though I reserve the right to be wrong. However, this is where the story takes a twist. It was only two weeks later that he found another privilege escalation vulnerability, and this time he made it public instead of going to Valve first. And this is where, with a little condemnation from some fellow InfoSec peeps, Valve finally gave in and reversed their decision. They released a statement which essentially says that they misinterpreted their own rules and this bug was in fact legitimate. Though I kind of just take that to meaning that they caved to public pressure, which is probably a good thing in this case. They even updated their scope definition on HackerOne to state any case that allows malware or compromised software to perform a privilege escalation through Steam without providing administrative credentials or confirming a UAC dialogue is in scope. So all's well that ends well. And they did go on to give some PR BS about how they really love bug hunters from the bottom of their greedy money grabbing hearts, but um, we'll, we'll skip that. However, they didn't unban him from their program, which means there's probably still a little salt in those wounds. So let me know what you think of this in the comments. Was Valve right to deny this being a vulnerability in the first place? And what do you think of their capitulation? Now, it wouldn't be a satonic video without taking a moment to shill my website, maltronics.com, which sells a whole variety of pen testing tools, hacker hardware, and just fun infosec gadgets. For example, the Wi-Fi Deauthor is a small device which allows you to kick other people off a Wi-Fi network whether you're connected to it or not. It takes advantage of flaws in WPA2 in order to deauthenticate clients from a network. It goes without saying that you should use this only on networks you own or have permission to screw with, so check it out in the description, maltronics.com, I'll link those Wi-Fi deauthors. Next up, IBM is making the news with their new quantum computer-proof encryption techniques. You may have heard how quantum computers, decades in the future, will be able to break the encryption we use and rely on today. And this is a real concern. An article on Technology Review explains how researchers have found a way to break a 2048-bit RSA encryption key in just eight hours. And by the way, HTTPS, SSL, the layer we use to encrypt pretty much all of our web traffic by default uses 2048-bit RSA encryption. So this is, this is big news. However, the one caveat to this story is that we are probably about a quarter century off the hardware needed 
to be able to break this encryption, i.e. the hardware just doesn't exist yet, so don't panic. However, IBM are getting their head start and have developed a way to protect archived data in particular against these quantum attacks. See, the issue here is that data could be harvested now and then decrypted in 25 years time, which when it comes to your internet purchases, your credit card information, that's probably not a big deal. You know, in the year 2045, people aren't gonna care what your credit card information was in 2019. No. <laughs> However, this is a problem for governments. Super classified information now is still probably going to be super classified in the year 2045. I mean, imagine if we had access to all government communications pre-1994. I'm sure there's a lot of juicy stories in there. So IBM has developed these cryptographic algorithms that are designed to be resilient to quantum computers. Specifically, they've integrated these algorithms into tape drives, which might seem like an odd choice. After all, tape drives have been around I don't know, 60 years or something like that. However, they do have an advantage in that they're very cost effective over hard drives. So they're popular among tech giants when you want to store massive amounts of data. It just makes way more sense to put them into cold storage on tape drives as opposed to hard drives. And these drives they're developing are still in prototype. However, they have announced they'll start providing quantum safe cryptography on the IBM public cloud later next year. And these algorithms they developed have been made open sourced and I'll link more technical information in the description if you are so inclined. In this week in stupid, and this isn't security related, though it was quite funny, so I thought I'd include it. Remember the Apple card, that glorious sheet of titanium that Apple announced a few months ago? When they announced it, they managed to make it sound like some feat of engineering. They talked about having a multi-layer coating process and a titanium-based material and all this complicated stuff. And you would have thought titanium equals durable. At least, you know, that's what I thought, given they do make planes out of this stuff, fighter jets. However, it has come to light that this Apple card is probably the most delicate credit card ever created. Apple published this article with instructions on how to clean your Apple card because it turns out it is damaged real easy by leather and denim, i.e. you can't put this in a leather wallet because it will screw it up. You can't put it in jeans because it will also screw it up. It will, it will scratch it, it will discolor it. So that rules out 90% of wallets by default. And God forbid your Apple card touches another credit card because that'll scratch it and it'll probably implode or something. Apple Insider tweeted this photo of an Apple card after just one month. Now, credit cards get scuffed. They wear pretty easily. However, this is just something else. Now, it's not security related, though I thought it was a quintessential Apple story that I just had to include because it's just so goddamn typical. <laughs> Rumor has it, Apple will start offering card socks from just $99, a pragmatic approach to caring for your Apple card. Next, over to Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan had an embarrassing week, and I mean embarrassing week in the news. Since July, internet users across Kazakhstan have been receiving messages from telecom operators asking them to install Quasnet on their smartphones, computers, and other devices connected to the internet. But what even is a Quasnet? Well, it's not as high tech as it sounds, but it is still pretty menacing. It's a root CA certificate that would enable the Kazakh government to monitor internet users' web traffic. You see, most websites nowadays rely on HTTPS to transmit data securely, encrypted. HTTPS uses certificates to verify the legitimacy of websites. That's why people say to always look out for the padlock in the corner of the address bar to know whether you're on a site you can trust. And by the way, the padlock in the top corner of the address bar doesn't necessarily mean you should trust the site with anything. It just means you're protected from man in the middle attacks, from people snooping in on your data as it's in transit. Well, the Kazakh government found a way or thought they had to get around this. You see, they led a campaign to get their citizens to install the government's own certificate in their browser. Now, this would leave citizens open to man-in-the-middle attacks. The government would be able to decrypt data transmitted between users and websites. For example, social media posts and password, they'd all be able to snoop in on. And based on research from Censored Planet, it found that the government was targeting 37 sites for interception, including Gmail, YouTube, Google Docs, Facebook, Instagram, and, and many others. So the good news is this would only affect users who are dumb enough to install the certificate. So presumably anyone with anything to hide just wouldn't bite. They're just not gonna install the certificate because why would they? So in my opinion, this was just an exercise in futility by the Kazakh government. I don't see how they thought they could get anything tangible out of this. 
Maybe you've got a few dumb criminals, I don't know. Though this whole exercise shouldn't come as too much of a surprise. Kazakhstan has a pretty bad record when it comes to internet freedom. Freedomhouse.org is an organization which rates companies on their internet freedom. And they gave Kazakhstan a score of 62 out of 100, where 100 is complete censorship, no internet access allowed whatsoever, and zero is complete freedom. By contrast, the USA is rated at 22, and Estonia, tied with Iceland, is rated 6. Those two are the most free countries. Though it would seem Apple, Mozilla, Google have all pledged to block this certificate from being used in their browsers. And of course, they've all released statements advocating for internet freedom and such, they will all skip their virtue signaling for now. However, since then, the Kazakh government has discontinued the scheme, which they initially just justified as a way to improve national cybersecurity, because of course they did. The government had said that installing the certificate was a voluntary measure that is meant to protect people's security. Whatever that means, sounds like pretty unequivocal BS to me. And on that bombshell, I think we're done. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this week's security roundup. And if you want to learn more about any of the stories I've discussed today, links, sources, all of that will of course be in the description. Make sure to subscribe for more hacking videos. And as always, thanks for watching.